Church in Kiskey Presbytery. I'm also the uh, CPM chair. And in Kiskey, we kind of grouped education in with that. And so we also work with supporting and training our CREs. So hence why I'm interesting, interested in bending the rule book, maybe bending it pretty far in some instances. So, uh, oh dear, it looks like I'm echoing. Sorry about that. Um, I'm not in charge of technology. That is Elizabeth. So I hope she can do something about that. Anyways, I don't want to take any more time, but I would like to introduce our panel for discussion. So um, you all know Reverend Dr. Wayne Yost. He will be leading our discussion. Um, we have Reverend Dr. Matthew Camlin, stated presbyterian, stated clerk of um, Shenango. Would you wave so people can see you? There you are. Uh, we have Elder Marie Wright, stated clerk of the Presbytery of West Virginia. Can you? There you go. Um, Reverend Kevin Porter, stated clerk, Presbytery of Philadelphia. There you are. And the Reverend Dr. Carl Wilton, acting stated clerk, Presbytery of the Highlands. So there you go. Welcome everyone. Um, hope we can answer some questions and maybe stir the pot a little. I like doing that because usually the good stuff rises to the top or that's my theme. Anyways. I'm gonna open us with prayer and then I'm gonna turn it over to Wayne and he can get us all started. So let us pray. Good and gracious God, we're so grateful for all that you have done for us. I'm thankful for all of those who have joined us here today. Lord, I pray that as they are with us today, that you would keep your hand upon their congregations and those places that they are responsible. Um, keep everybody safe and well. Lord, I ask that you would help us to keep our ears and eyes open to where you are doing a new thing. Lord, we don't want to go ahead of you and mess things up. We don't want to lag behind and miss opportunities. Lord, make us aware of where you are working and how we can join you to serve the people with joy, with creativity, with faithfulness. Lord, I ask your blessings upon our time together and upon our presenters and ask that you would just be with us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, Colleen was a former student of mine in polity and uh, mm -hmm. was very glad to be able to snag her in the Kiski Presbytery when, when I was the EP there. Uh, good to see you, Colleen. And uh, you as well, Thank you. Uh, thanks to our four uh, panelists who have uh, agreed to, to join us. Uh, I wanna give a plug for Carl's book, Presbyterian Principles, uh, Presbyter Principles in Presbyterian Polity. Uh, if you are doing uh, commission ruling elder training and for those new to Presbyterian ministry, I highly recommend this book as, as one of the, the books that you get. Uh, Principles of Presbyterian Polity by Carl Welton. Thanks, Carl, for putting that out for us. Thank you. Uh, There's a new edition on the way, they tell me, at the publisher. Oh, good. I'll be anxious to see that. Um, I used to, to say to uh, students in a polity class that there are two illegitimate uses of the Book of Order. One is as a club to make people do what they normally would not want to do. The other is to use it as a shield to keep others from making you do what you don't want to do. The Book of Order is really 
a tool for mission and ministry and an agreement on how we're going to live together. So the question is, how can we bend the book without breaking the rules? Uh, there were times I have said, uh, if there is something you want to do and you think the book prohibits it, give me some time and I'll find a way around it. So bending the book without breaking the rules. We do have some questions that were given uh, by you, uh, in, some of you in advance. And let me begin with uh, one is that we received early and then received again uh, yesterday. Can ruling elders be given permission to moderate sessions? So that's, that's, that's the jump ball question. Anybody on the panel want to grab that? I'm willing to go first. I don't need to go first. But I guess I'll jump for the ball. Uh, so I think the answer to that question is yes, because the Book of Order doesn't say no. Uh, and that may sound unintentionally glib, but to me, a governing print the governing principle, what is not prohibited is permitted is preferable to what is not permitted is prohibited. So, and I think that's specifically why the book of order and in particular the form of government was completely rewritten several years ago. So it, with that in mind, I look at this question um, and think that because there is no explicit reason why a clerk of session cannot serve as an appointed moderator for another congregation, uh, there's no reason why a presbytery could not elect to do so. Um, I, I did some advanced work uh, in preparation for answering this question. So I can tell you that in G 1.0504, uh, it says that if there is no installed pastor or the installed pastor is unable to moderate and or name another moderator, the presbytery shall make provision for a moderator. And then they use the same language in uh, section three uh, when they're talking about moderators of session. But it doesn't say anything about who is eligible to serve in that capacity. So I think that that providing that uh, those guidelines or those uh, qualifications are up to the presbytery to decide. Uh, it says uh, another minister of word and sacrament who is a member of the presbytery or a person authorized by the presbytery to serve as moderator. But it doesn't say who that could be. So from there, a presbytery could extrapolate and say, well, maybe a group of ruling elders could be properly trained by the presbytery specifically to moderate sessions or congregations when called upon by the presbytery to do so at a, at a congregation's or session's request. So I think that I would say yes, but they ought to be very, they ought to be very uh, well trained by the presbytery and they cannot just roam around the countryside moderating sessions uh, at their leisure. They should be requested by the congregation or session from the presbytery, and the presbytery should then send them on uh, uh, at re upon request. And the, the the book I don't have the citation right here says that anything not assigned to another council <laughs> is reserved to the presbytery. So. That gives latitude to drive many trucks through. Maureen, you had a comment. Um, what I would always say is, um, I think Matt, thanks for for uh, set, setting that up and and um, giving us such good citations. I I tend to think about what what is it that you're trying to accomplish as a presbytery and what's the need of that con of congregations what helps congregations um and trying to answer those questions i think when it comes to moderators um interestingly enough i think i'm the only one on the panel who's a ruling elder 
and I'm called on at times in various thing, uh, events in our presbytery to teach classes on moderating, which is kind of a funny uh, little juxtaposition there. But um, let me say, one of the things is, what do you hope that a moderator is going to do? Um, is, is the moderator going to simply be the person that makes sure they're kind of the, the, the bumpers on the side of the road? Um, are they going to direct the church in ways? Are they just there to help make sure that things run smoothly? What, what do you want that moderator to do? And in particular, I think for presbyteries, I would ask you, what's the question for the moderator of um, who is who are they representing and how are they representing the presbytery? Not so much can can only ministers of word and sacrament do that, but you know, what do you want them to do? A kind of broaden the question out some would just be what I would encourage churches to do. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> Thanks, Maureen. Did somebody else have a comment? Yeah, so this is Carl, uh, Carl Wilton here. Uh, I would want to focus on the fact that I think the most important principle is that the presbytery is in charge of moderation of sessions. Remember, of course, that when a pastor is serving as moderator, the pastor is a member of presbytery, which is not true of anyone else sitting around the session table. It also happens to be true that the pastor is a member of the session. Uh, though, of course, not a member of the congregation. And so when there's not a, a pastor installed in the church, Presbytery needs to find someone to be the moderator. And there is, as, as Matt helpfully pointed out, no restriction vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, minister of the word and sacrament or ruling elder in terms of who that can be. And I think, the, as Matt also pointed out, the present form of government was designed to be flexible in just that way uh, without putting a lot of... Uh, requirements uh, in the way that have to be met specifically, but focuses more on the, the general need for having presbytery to have a connection with what happens at the session table. And so the moderator, I think, represents the presbytery in terms of uh, calling the session back to priorities of the presbytery and matters that the presbytery wants to see addressed, uh, but also uh, is in enough regular contact with the congregation to know what the issues are, know what the personalities are, and I would also want to heighten the, uh, or emphasize rather the importance of training uh, for those who uh, uh, serve as moderators, both for uh, ruling elders and for ministers of the word and sacrament. Because really how many courses in seminary focus on the art of moderation, uh, which is an important role. And I think uh, training is, is very, very valuable for everyone in that regard. Thanks, Carl. Anybody, uh, any of the participants in, in this want to, raise additional questions or comment on um, moderator of session. Before New Fog, the book said that members of COM could be appointed uh, as moderators. Um, the, a question was asked in another form, can that still happen? And the answer is there's nothing in the Book of Order to prohibit it. Uh, there was a question about sending up an, uh, a, a, an overture to put that back in the Book of Order, but it's not necessary because we already have the permission to do whatever is necessary. Marie, we have a hand up. Okay, Aaron. Um, one of the things that we did was um, commission Nan Best, um, who many of you know in the Synod, um, we commissioned her to all of our congregations for preaching and sacraments and moderating session and meetings of the congregation. So we had already worked through all of our pre-approvals and had her available to deploy when we needed something more than pulpit supply in a church without a pastor. Good, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. And you can put your hand down. Have any of the rest of you thought of doing that, of uh, deploying uh, two, three, four uh, ruling elders to serve 
as moderators of sessions at need. I don't see any heads nodding. Kathy Matt, you were. Dermer. Oh, okay, uh, Kathy. At Kiski, we we have talked about it. It's, it's just been in the talking stages um, about how we have to to think about how we're going to do this and who we would um, how we would train them and who would be selected to do this. You don't want just anybody volunteering to do this. It's not the best idea. So, but we have talked about it at Kiski in uh, in our. Um, MC meetings, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kathy, let me ask, uh, does Kiski still have the Shepherd program in COM? Yes, we do. Uh, I wonder about appointing the, each congregation Shepherd as a moderator. That yeah, would be something, that. yeah. I don't know, what do you think, uh, Colleen? Well, the shepherd program is only as good as the shepherd. And so we have some who are better than others. And we have some who encounter things that they are not trained or capable of dealing with. And so that we found that program is not always helpful uh, all the time. So, um, yeah, that's that's a concern. But. I do see that we have a question in the chat is one I was getting ready to put out there. So thanks, Craig. Um, what would your main categories be in a good moderator training program? I, I was thinking about that. I, I can take a first stab and I think, you know, Kevin and Matt and uh, Carl probably have some things to add to it. Um, what I would say is, there needs to be some understanding of polity. There needs to be some understanding of Robert's rules of order, you know, kind of some basics in, in both of those. Um, you know, some, some what, how do you understand groups? How, how do you, you know, do groups? Um, you know, it's interesting because we've had several conversations in our presbytery recently about what is the role of a, a moderator that's appointed versus uh, the role of the moderator who's an installed pastor uh, because an appointed moderator isn't a person that is a member of that session necessarily. They, they are there as a guide in a lot of ways, but they're not setting the agenda in the same way. Um, so how do you put together an agenda? How, how do you do those things? How do you work with the clerk of session and other session members to put that together um, would be some good things, um, you know, some, some good old fashioned group process kinds of uh, understandings. And I, I see head shaking and I, I'm gonna let some others uh, chime in and add some things to that list. Thanks, Maureen. Kevin? Yeah, thanks for starting things off and for the invitation. I was thinking back to when uh, Carl was saying about uh, how little training we had in seminary about moderating. And I was thinking, I actually had, I, uh, my undergrad degree was in social psychology. I feel uh, like I lean more on that. Okay. And also I was, uh, I worked in um, Prudential Insurance in their management intern program. So bottom line is I think folks get a lot of either they have the natural skill set and or they get a lot of training and in a lot of other forms on group process, on conflict management. Uh, and a lot of it depends also on what the situation of the session is. If you're going into a session meeting where the conflict level is high and that's particularly maybe the reason for the meeting mm -hmm. and someone with those conflict management skills might be the, uh, of course, uh, in addition to polity, but you know the, that that core skill of conflict management might be a more helpful uh, skill. So, form follows function. We're here to support the ministries of our congregations, and if a session at a particular moment needs a particular skill set, then folks all across our churches have access to getting those skills in ways other than you know uh, ministry. Mm -hmm. One of the Thank points that I. Uh, 
the place in my Carl? book on principles of polity where I talk about moderators is under the principle of mutual forbearance. And the reason for that is that I, I see moderators as the, the mutual forbearance officer uh, in terms of a local church governance. Uh, that's a, when it comes to conflict resolution and, and bearing with one another through difficult times, uh, the role of the moderator is really to step, keep out of the back and forth of the debate and to make watch the overall tone of the room, uh, mood of the room, and, and see how to uh, keep communication going and, and keep, uh, uh, keep conflict at a minimum. So that's uh, probably the most crucial skill, other than the very important practical skills, like knowing the basics of Robert's rules, uh, knowing how to relate to the clerk of session, and knowing how sessions are different, that there are uh, different traditions in terms of who, pre who prepares the docket or agenda, uh, how the meetings are structured, uh, whether it's a worshipful work kind of uh, pattern where you have a worship uh, interspersed uh, through different items of business, or whether it's a more straight get her done kind of a, a business oriented agenda. Uh, there are different traditions. And so a moderator coming in needs to be sensitive to what has been done and uh, perhaps uh, inject some new ideas as well of, of how things could be done differently. Thank you, Carl. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Wayne, let me, one other Wayne. thing that I, I think is worth mentioning as maybe presbyteries might consider this option and how it could help their churches and congregations. It seems to me that there's a lot about moderating that is attached to um, emotional intelligence and how can you read the room? And I'm not sure how a COM might want to address that issue as candidates for being trained might come forward, but it probably ought to be part of the discussion. Excellent, thank you. Uh, let me point out one thing. You see on over Kevin's head, many things that look like candles. Those are uh, various um, corporate seals that Kevin has collected and he has them arranged in a typical candelabra style. <laughs> You want to say something about that, Kevin? Yeah, it, so those are the um, corporate seals of different congregations over the years that have closed. So when we inherit the, the, the effects of different congregations, those are the different corporate seals. And what I tell folks is see the big one in the middle and see the small one on the end. The churches are equally closed. So... <laughs> <laughs> Just like um, steeple envy, the whole goal of us is to, you know, just help congregations live out their lives to the fullest. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let me move us in another direction, if, if I may. Uh, in the last session with Tim Cargill, a question was asked about um, ministers' compensation uh, and why doesn't the Presbyterian Church come up with a system where the, um, let me just put it crudely, the wealthier churches support the congregations that can't afford a minister, either separately or in uh, groups. Uh, anybody have thoughts on that? Let me, let me go first. Um, in Kiski Presbytery, we used to have a program called area ministry, where one pastor would be assigned to three, four, five, six, at one point in the distant history, even 10 congregations as their pastor moderator. The congregations chipped in a little bit. The presbytery and the synod chipped in significant money. And that went for several years. And then um, uh, some of the area ministers themselves uh, suggested ending that program, but uh, it was becoming, in the case of Kiski, and Tim, you can chime in if you have a different view on this. Uh, in the case of Kiski, it was getting to be more than the Presbytery could afford. So what about 
those congregations with more financial resources helping to underwrite the pastoral services in smaller congregations. Tim, do you have anything to say? I guess not. Anybody else? Anybody on the panel? Kevin. Well, I mean, so we all know about the life cycle of congregations, right? Um, that even our largest church one day is going to shut its doors if, if uh, Christ tarries in his return. So what we're, what we we're seeking to do in Philly is try to figure out what congregations, I mean, we, our, our covenant community, we have, we, have, we have connection with each other. We have a mutual accountability and support in helping ministry thrive. So if uh, particular congregations can exhibit uh, something that's in the Presbytery's uh, mission strategy that we would like to support, we would like to find ways to help that ministry thrive. Uh, likewise, if there are other congregations where um, they do perceive kind of their um, church as a country club and they want to just make sure that they keep the doors open so that they can be buried there, uh, we're not going to necessarily get support from the larger presbytery to help that happen. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's once again trying to maximize the possibility of doing an effective mission and ministry within our bounds. And that's the way that we perceive help. It's, it's not cookie cutter, but in cases where we feel that we are uh, maximizing the ministry, uh, we want to give opportunity for other folks to participate in that beyond their own congregation. So you're talking about some strategic decision making. Anybody else? Uh, Matt. I have seen a model like what you're talking about uh, working in the Presbyterian Church in Malawi, Africa, the uh, CCAP, the uh, Church of Central Africa Presbyterian. Um, they had their, in their system, their pastors uh, receive a very small stipend from the six to eight congregations they might be serving. Uh, they are not expected to show up at all eight churches every Sunday, obviously, or even, or perhaps even over the course of an entire week or two. It may take them a month to get to all eight of those churches. Uh, most of their salary is paid for by their synod. And uh, in the absence of the pastor, the elders of the church are charged with caring for the congregation, preaching in the pastor's absence, uh, handling pastoral care and even funerals uh, when the pastor cannot be at that, uh, in the location of that particular congregation at the time of a, of a death. Um, and so the elders play a, a much more significant role in caring for their congregations than our typical American model. Um, I think, and I, I tossed this idea out there several years ago when I was still living in Upper Ohio Valley Presbytery, uh, which is the presbytery that sent me to Malawi. Um, I threw, I tossed this idea out there and said, an argument could be made in, at least in the American context for developing a system where pastors could serve a, a broad number of churches and in their absence, we could have commissioned ruling elders trained by the presbytery to, to sort of pick up the slack and do the things that need to be done in those localities when the pastor cannot be there. And so the, the CREs become, in a sense, associate pastors to the pastor of this you know, parish of five or six churches. Um, I don't know whether it's possible perhaps that five or six churches working together could come up with enough money to pay the salaries of a pastor that would move around amongst those congregations. This, this isn't going to appeal to large churches in, in uh, more metropolitan uh, areas, but in the little country churches that we're all fretting about who can't afford pastors and are dying on the vine for lack of leadership, a model like this could be a lifesaver. I don't know whether a presbyt what presbyteries currently funded the way they are. I think pr even presbyteries might find it difficult to actually aid in funding this, which is how this, which is the first question that was asked. 
Um, but I think there's something to be said for larger churches who can afford a solo pastor and then have some money left over could perhaps help support these little churches in hiring a pastor and then, and then surrounding that pastor or, or, or helping to support that pastor by providing some uh, commissioned ruling elders to aid them in their ministry. Yeah, um, sometimes that's referred to as cathedral satellite model. Mm -hmm. um, and it would mean that the uh, quote unquote cathedral church would have to share their pastor's time uh, with the satellites. Um, my experience has been that uh, sessions aren't very willing to do that. Agreed. But I also, but in this case, it's not. I would say it's not necessarily that there's a tall steeple pastor who's sharing his time with other churches, but that this pastor is the pastor of five or six churches, none of which are, are particularly large. And this is the only way that any of these five or six small churches can be expected to have pastoral leadership because they none of them would be able to afford one without the help of the others. And what Matt is describing is also sometimes called the larger parish. And what you have, we need to do is to form a, a grouping of churches, three or four congregations, maybe more, maybe fewer, uh, that, be, that will be willing to partner together uh, under that kind of system. Uh, they would each contribute something to the pastor's compensation. But the pastor would be, uh, yes, in a certain sense, pastor of all those churches, but uh, the reliance on and training of commission ruling elders is absolutely key to that. So the pastor is almost more of a regional administrator in some way, but rotating amongst the churches and having some presence in each of them. A very different skill set than uh, many folks out there today, and we don't really have good models for training of folks like that. Uh, the practical difficulty, as I think Rain, Wayne was uh, uh, alluding to there, is that sometimes getting smaller congregations to agree to partner together like that is like herding cats. Uh, they're very different uh, very often, uh, one, one compared to another. Sometimes there are theological differences. They might have a hard time agreeing on what sort of person ought to be the pastor of the larger parish. So, but it's a fruitful model and a good possibility, and one that I think we really need to find ways to explore in many of our presbyteries. I was introduced at the beginning as a acting stated clerk of Highlands Presbytery, which you might not have heard of. It's one of the new presbyteries in New Jersey, but that's only a part-time gig for me. I'm actually uh, interim pastor, transitional pastor in Hawley, Pennsylvania, in Lackawanna Presbytery, where I serve in the COM. And we have, in Lackawanna, have a number of smaller churches that are underserved by pastoral leadership. And we're, we're having conversations about how can we group them together. Uh, there was one, a uh, two-congregation yoke that is still kind of together, but the pastor didn't last there very long. He was a newly ordained person has moved on uh, to a more traditional single pastor, solo pastor approach. Uh, but, you know, so I'm very familiar with this from the standpoint of committee on ministry work. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it'd be great to have some resources or some models to follow and, and how to put together that kind of structure, because it does offer a, a lot of promise for the future, I think. Yes. And Carl, West Virginia. go ahead, Maureen. I was just going to say, West Virginia has a fairly strong history with that model. Um, we have, a, a, it's, it's large by a lot of standards, but it's small by what it once was. We have a parish of four churches that are using that model currently. Um, and I, what I'd say is I think the COM key is how much grassroots and relational uh, work it takes to get churches to agree to do that. I mean, I'd, I'd love to wave my magic stated clerk wand and have, you know, even as many as 10 other parishes, but um, convincing churches that this is a good model for them can be challenging. So um, I, I do, I think it's relational, but building those relationships, COM, are you in there? Do you know your churches and, you know, fostering that, um, but setting it up, uh, if you need help, call me and we can provide some issues. Dot. 
that uh, that model is widely used here in rural Pennsylvania, Northern Pennsylvania. And interestingly, um, I have been a pastor of two and three different parishes. Um, the Methodists up here use that dynamic extensively. Presbyterians, not so much. But what I have found over the years is the difference is the polity itself. In the Methodist church, their bishop can just say to churches, this is what we're going to do. We are much more independent and like trying to herd cats, unfortunately. Um, and stubbornly so. <laughs> amen. Um, and I think the, um, the dynamic, I think, is going to be used more and more as we can't find pastors for in this area. But ju just as a matter of, you know, the Methodists do it very well and have for a number of years. Yeah. And another dynamic that is in play is the willingness of ministers to move to rural areas and serve multiple congregations. Um, there's, I have not seen a, a significant willingness of ministers to do that. Other comments on that? We have David Smith from Northumberland who'd like to share. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, that was uh, one of the things I was hoping that um, Tim would get to um, in the demographics. It's too early to, to say, but exactly what you were just hinting at there, Wayne, and our situation with Dots churches in northern Pennsylvania as has been much on our minds recently. Um, but I want to know if the uh, one of the at least short term effects of the pandemic is going to be a change. We, as Dot said, even at one of our bigger churches, we had a church of pushing 300 members uh, 15 kids at a children's lesson, uh, wide demographic, uh, major hospital in town, major university across the river. It took them three years to find a pastor, and they were offering real money. Um, and I just wondered, and, and it was the typical, is there a Starbucks in the town? Is there a, and, uh, you know, I, I moved here and I found that North Central PA was incredibly well situated because if I cared to, I could go to New York in three hours. I don't. Um, I could go to Pennsylvania, to Philadelphia in three hours, and I do. Um, I could go to uh, Pittsburgh a little over three, like Baltimore also. Like, I feel like we're well within reach of things, but I want to know if it's going to change when people wanted to get out of the city in 2020 and now as people are thinking more about what are the effects of uh, the isolation, but also the concentration, and are some of our candidates or younger pastors looking to move uh, early on, are they going to reconsider some of these um, more far afield uh, calls or even truly rural calls? Um, that, that may be a swing depending on how long uh, the shutdown goes. But I was hoping Tim would comment on that, even though I know we don't have numbers yet. But this will be something interesting to watch, I think. Yeah. Thanks, David. Kevin, you posted a comment in the chat. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so um, I guess it was kind of connected to the point about um, uh, smaller churches and expecting the larger churches to support them. What we really start with is the sense of, does, does the congregation have a sense of ministry and mission uh, if they understand what God is calling them to do and what gifts they have for doing it, then from that discussion, figure out what kind of pastoral leadership do they need to accomplish that. That we have a, a much uh, greater way of finding pastoral leadership than folks that think we're small and all we need is a pastor to make things happen. Because I think that that that's where we have to challenge them to dig deeper and figure out uh, what is it that they felt they're called to do and what gifts that they already have to bring to the table. Um, mm -hmm. And I think when, when congregations are that specific, it does help them figure out if they can use something that's bivocational, if they can be part of a more comprehensive parish where um, if they're called to do senior ministry and that's what they're gifted to do, another parish may be doing the youth ministry and you can do the boutique model. But uh, we just want to keep folks from thinking that the one church, one pastor, one building model is the only way to do things. And if we don't have a pastor, that's the, that's the uh, answer to the magic wand. Yeah. 
Thanks, Kevin. Dot. We did something kind of out of the box up here. I'm retiring um, the end of June. And I told my congregations that two years ago um, and took the chance that I would still be able to be a, a viable pastor for them and giving them that much time. But the reason I did it was knowing how hard it is to get a pastor in this part of the, the state. And the two churches I serve, one is completely PCUSA, the other one is a union church of Methodist and PCUSA. And they started working together, formed a task force, um, did kind of their own internal mission study. What do we want? Who are we? Where are we moving in the future? And then they started advertising in lots of places um, with what they were looking for. If we want just a PCUSA pastor, the pickings were very slim. If you open that up, though, to... Uh, I, I think there's sites on there, pastor search sites. They had over 50 people contact them and send resumes that were interested in coming. Interestingly, the way it finally worked out was that the Methodists um, had someone for the union church and you don't get a choice. You take who they tell you you're gonna get. And so they did. And then the PCUSA congregation worked with this candidate to, to see if the fit would work, et cetera. And they decided to do the other half time with him, um, but com completely out of the box and watching them do it was pretty phenomenal. Um, when they said they, they had all these resumes and then you have to figure out theologically if people fit and if you can can kind of gulp and not have a PCUSA pastor in the pulpit. We do have uh, the formula of agreement in our book of order, which uh, especially in Pennsylvania, there are a lot of Lutherans around. And sometimes I think we don't uh, explore enough the possible interrelationships with ELCA Lutherans, often in communities that have a Lutheran church and a Presbyterian church. We have full interchangeability of pastors uh, between the two denominations. And so uh, perhaps some ecumenical conversations might open some doors. I also think in talking to the head of that committee that the majority of candidates that contacted them were probably 50 plus coming from um, more urban areas and wanting to retire in a rural setting and get out of the city. So that's kind of the demographics of that too. Hmm. Kevin? We've had some recent success with a couple of Baptists that actually went to um, either uh, Lutheran Seminary or Princeton Seminary so that they've gotten, uh, uh, and maybe they've done their field ed in some uh, Presbyterian churches. So even though that they've been ordained with uh, some of them are not in full agreement with what we've done then has had folks uh, from our CPM uh, assigned to help them with some of the polity work as, they're, as they've been student pastors or have mentors to help them with some of that uh, until our CPM and COM are in agreement that they uh, can be transitioned over. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I would encourage um, that you look at um, the presbyterianmission.org site that came out uh, just um, on the 13th, um, an article, uh, church membership in the U.S. now less than half, quoting the Gallup poll and so forth. I think Brian Heron, the pastor that was interviewed, um, has some significant insights. What, part of what he says is I encur largely encourage our pastors, he's a, uh, uh, let me, for lack of a better term, say EP in the Northwest, I encourage our pastors to take a chaplain approach to saying to congregations discerning their future, quote, I can comfort you and take care of you for as long as you are here, parentheses, a hospice-like approach, close parentheses, 
or I can walk with you on a journey of transformation. But it is important that the decision is yours. One road will lead to your eventual closure. The other will bring uh, significant uh, turmoil and trauma, but it is the, the way of growth. Um, any reactions to that? Dot? Again, I can react to that from a Methodist point of view. Um, they tried that up here and um, had all the churches, all the rural churches go through a discernment process. <clears throat> it didn't work. Um, the churches did not get on board with that. Those that wanted to stay open till the last person closed the door stayed just like that. Um, and I don't think I, they had some who said, oh, sure, we would like to move into the future, et cetera. But the reality was they didn't have the vision for that. It had to be brought in to them. Um, it, 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 that's a tough road to hoe to try to get small churches to have the, the, um, the energy and the vision to be able to do that. I, I've read that if you want your church to grow, start a new church. Hmm. Other questions, comments? I think connecting um, what you said, Wayne, with also what uh, has been in the chat box about you, what came to my mind is the importance of agency. If uh, churches feel like they're having the yoke thrust upon them, uh, that's different than if it's really from the ground up. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, is it your hospice or um, path of transformation comment? We're grateful for what's happened with what was first African Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia and now is New River Presbyterian Church the merger of First African Calvin and Good Shepherd, but it was very, and this, I'm speaking as someone who worked with two of those three churches as well as three others in an initiative that the Presbytery tried to do 20 years ago to get the churches talking to each other and got significant pushback. This time under a different EP and a different Kairos, it was much more relational, much more starting with their sense of mission, having exploratory conversations about joint possible joint ministry witness, and it was much more organic. So I think really supporting the congregations in their agency and um, was, was very key for us. Thank you. Kathy, Wayne. just a second, Marie. Kathy? We, we talked about this at Kiski and um, uh, Gary Lyon even went out and uh, talked to several churches, invited them to meet together to talk about a shared ministry rather than calling it a yoke, a shared ministry. And he presented it as being, well, if, you're, if this church is really good at youth ministry, they could uh, put, put that together. And another church is good with Bible study, et cetera, whatever their strengths were. Um, when he called that meeting, one church showed up. And that was it. So um, yeah. we're, we've not given up on it. We've not given up on it. Gary hasn't given up. Uh, hopefully we can, you know, after COVID has is, is passed us, we can try this again. So, Thanks, Kathy. Maureen? I was just going to say, you know, um, as much as it pains me, I think, though, we do have the obligation to walk without judgment for those who just say, no, we can't do this. We want hospice care. You know, that, you know, that, that that's a legitimate answer, um, e even though it's a difficult answer. Um, and I, I, I hope the spirit would move and it wouldn't be the answer all the time, but sometimes it is. And then you just walk that road too. In saying that, Maureen, is it okay to say then as a presbytery, we are not going to fret about you or spend much money and time on you. Hmm. 
I would say we have an obligation to walk that journey with people. And I, I don't know exactly what that means. I don't put particular, I, I mean, I know we're all making stewardship choices because it's a difficult time. Um, but I think we have the obligation to, to walk with them on that journey. I don't, I don't know how much money you put into it. I don't know how that translates to staff time or COM time and the stewardship of that. Um, but you, you still have to walk that road. Aaron, Believe me, I have 120 some churches. I know that road. Yep. <laughs> Uh, Aaron, you posted something in chat. You want to speak to that? You're muted. <clears throat> Sorry, I unmuted and then it muted again. Um, well, I was posting a bit. Um, we have done a lot of work here with um, a field called narrative therapy, um, the social construction of preferred realities. Uh, the books by Jill Friedman and Jean Coombs, they're married, um, and it's following some work of Milton Erickson. Um, and it follows a sequence of um, understanding problem-saturated narratives of which our congregations have many. Mm -hmm. I kind of divide them into what I call lament, which are the genuine grievances, um, pains and traumas, and what Bart used to call cavilling, which is complaints, and you come at those differently. But there comes a moment where you're trying to move to um, looking for something that sparkles, anything that contradicts the problem saturated narrative, and building that into a new narrative, which eventually can become a preferred future. Um, it, and that choosing of the preferred future rather than having it thrust upon them is the, the art form. Um, and I think takes a lot of finesse. Um, I think coaching training helps a lot with that and appreciative inquiry. But we find um, that really listening for the sparkle and looking at how to develop that is how we work with congregations to see if there's an opening to go beyond the problem saturated narratives. Um, I was going on to say, and an example is Bethany Presbyterian Church in the West End of Lancaster City, which my husband is serving. Um, Post-retirement, turning 75, the income helps, but I think it's more the, uh, to go back to Tim Cargill's stuff, I think it's the, the staying alive in ministry is what motivates him. Um, they are mostly 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, if there were a way to bring younger generations in that were humanly possible, that would have happened already. But they hold, host the largest um, AA meeting in Lancaster City. They have um, three other recovery groups and a scouting program for, I would say, misfit, um, mostly young boys. And they host a Spanish-speaking congregation and an Aromo congregation. And I think one of the things, um, so that's a lot of wear and tear in their, their building that this older white congregation is paying for, and that gets frustrating. But in the middle of that problem, I think they come to understand themselves as the Sarahs and the Abrahams and the children and the new generations that they have launched and nurtured aren't out of their bodies um, or even their Bethany congregation, and yet it's alive. And so that becomes a new preferred reality um, that fuels them even as their numbers are somewhere between 30 to 50 um, and declining. Um, and yet it relieves them of the pressure to try to imagine that that Sunday morning congregation grows, but nonetheless, there's growth in what they, they, they um, nurture. And then the Presbytery is a partnership in the support of that collaboratory, as we call it, um, particularly um, because of the Aroma congregation and the Spanish speaking congregation and the way that it is so much more cost effective to have it all in one building than a bunch of different places. Okay. So that's an Thanks, example. Aaron. Yeah, thank you. Let me see if anybody who hasn't 
uh, had anything to say yet or given had the chance to say anything, wishes to speak up uh, another question, concern, issue uh, on how to uh, bend the book without breaking the rules. Colleen, are you seeing anybody with a hand? I am not. I have a thought, though. That's dangerous. I know. I know. And it always gets me in trouble. Um, and, and Kathy's grinning, and she knows. Why can't the church, capital C, give everybody a year of grace and permission to go try and do? knowing there's going to be a lot of mistakes made, but some things might stick. Um, I, I choose to be helpful. Maybe that's naive of me, but um, I, I, I wish our, our presbyteries could, and maybe some do, like get, get a section and like, okay, you guys just go play and let's see what percolates up and maybe some of it'll stick. Uh, call it a happy accident, call it um, Kairos time. I don't know. I'm just I'm wondering if anybody's had any, um, done anything like that. And now I'll be quiet. Okay, thanks Colleen. Kevin says, what's stopping churches from doing that? Uh, Ken, do you have anything to add? I'm, I work with uh, COM and the Presbytery of Huntington here, and we're kind of a dilemma like everyone else. We've got a lot of small churches, not big budgets, not, not pastors. And um, so we have a pretty significant commission lay pastor group and certified we do certified lay pastors in our in our um presbytery they can the certified can preach and also do communion so that has helped keep a number of those small churches being able to serve their communities um it's it's like the band-aid they're not gonna they're never gonna have a full-time call and install they can't afford it don't don't even look that route but they still find their themselves with a mission in their communities and still find finding ways to serve their their communities uh one of the other things we have a, a, a one of our larger churches <clears throat> that is without a pastor right now they're very rural very active and they spent a lot of time trying to you know with the p the nominating committee working and and what they're finding is what we've talked about is to get folks pastors to want to move to a rural community i mean they're rural they're not their biggest town is going to be a 45 minute drive to get to anything and they're finding a lot of pastors when they find that out are are kind of pulling back maybe not as interested but this is a very dynamic church a very active church i mean if it was in in the middle of a of a more suburban area they wouldn't have any trouble getting a pastor but the location and we've got a number of churches that way in our in our presbytery and, and most of you all do too and it's it's kind of frustrating for them because they know what their worship community is and they can't you know they're they're praying that the lord's going to bring them the right person but it's taken them a lot longer and COVID hasn't helped the situation either and the other thing that's very frustrating we've that church with a few others folks our ministers need to learn to respond if they've been asked they've sent stuff out Oh yeah. Church contacts them. Crickets from that minister to say yes, no, we're not, I'm still interested, I'm not interested. It's common sense and politeness. And for some reason, ministers today don't have that common sense and politeness to respond. And it's it's very noticeable in a couple of the churches we've been working with to try to find pastors. Our ministers need somebody to kick them in the butt and say, pay attention, folks. Common sense says you need to respond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Congregations or PNCs have had that same issue of not responding. Um, one of the things I'm wondering if we need if we need to point out to our 
to ministers is that Karl Barth served a basically rural congregation, and that gave him time to write the dogmatics. Um, all 500 volumes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any, any last words from those on our panel? Uh, let me start with Matt. Any, anything you want to add? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that uh, my other colleagues on the panel have uh, said what needs to be said uh, in response to a lot of the questions and queries. I'm grateful for the chance to be a part. Good, thank you. Um, Kevin? I did I just want to build on, on Colleen's point about, uh, I think the permission giving that was intended by uh, New Fog, um, it's our role to really encourage the congregations to dream and try and uh, fall down and get back up. That's what we're all about in our resurrection spirit. Okay, thank you. Maureen? One thing that I would just say, and if anybody is interested, they can contact me about it. Um, we really focused a lot on pastoral leadership in our conversation, but our <coughs> presbytery did start something um, two years ago now where we are training ruling elders to serve, be approved to serve communion in their churches of membership. Um, widespread at least now we did two or more trainings early on, but at least once a year now. And um, it's, a, it's a good program that's helping some of our small churches have better access to the Lord's Supper. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, Carl. Yes, uh, just building on what Kevin said about permission giving, as we talk about uh, bending uh, the book of order, uh, it really doesn't need to be bent that much because if we really understand it, in the right way, we understand it as a manual for mission. Uh, really, mission is primary, and the Book of Order is meant to be there to help us uh, enable that and, and foster that. Thank you, Carl. Thanks to uh, all, all of our uh, four panelists, and thanks to you all for uh, participating. You've raised some good questions, made some interesting statements. Um, and Colleen, I'm going to throw it back to you to close us out. All righty. Again, thank you all for your help, for your insight. Um, and um, I think we've heard some good stuff and I'm grateful for it. So I'll be taking that back to our meeting. Kathy, you're in charge of notes, okay? I forgot to tell you. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyways, um, let us close with prayer. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, you are a God of creativity. And in our ordination vows, that is something that we say that we will do. And I think sometimes we forget to look up and to follow where you're pointing. And we forget about that creativity that you have endowed us all with. So Lord, I ask your blessings upon this group to be creative. And we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings and care of us. And we ask that you would be with us as we go forward. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Thank Peace you and grace. All.